When I was about seven, my aunt gave both me and my sister really nice dolls. They were like infant sized. My sister's doll had blonde curly hair tied up, blue eyes, and a white dress with different colored hearts. Well, she was scared of it. I think dolls just freaked her out in general. So my grandma kept it, and for some reason hung it on her wall. I've always wondered why she did that. I never got to ask her, so if anyone knows, why do some people do that? She really just hung the doll by the dress with a nail above her bed. I just thought it was something to do with a Mexican superstition. It wasn't like she had a ton of dolls everywhere either, it was just this one doll. Well, we all had to sleep with it just hanging there because it was a one bedroom house. Then within a couple of days we all started having nightmares about the doll trying to kill or harm us. My sister and I slept on the floor and she woke me up and said the doll was calling my name, not hers. Mine. I told her to shut up because I thought she was trying to scare me. Then she started crying and said, No, I'm serious, please. I drowned her out and fell back asleep. I had a dream that I was alone in my school cafeteria and a little girl was singing the ABCs and I just knew it was under the vending machine. I walked to it and then my ankle got sliced when I got to the vending machine. I fell and couldn't walk. Our cafeteria had a stage and I looked up and she, the doll, was peeking her head through the curtain laughing at me. Then I woke up. Another day, I overheard my mom and aunt talking about their dreams they had of the doll and they all included just them and me. Like I was the only one, including themselves, that was in the dream. My mom said she and I were running from the house, that we both jumped in the car and she saw the shadow of the doll next to the car window that I kept telling her to let the doll in, and she wouldn't, so I started biting her. Then my aunt said the doll and I were sitting on the couch and I was acting and dressed weird. She said I was dressed like an old time little girl's clothes and that when I talked, she never saw my mouth move, but the doll was talking in my voice. She had a bad vibe, and once we realized that she felt a bad vibe, we attacked her. As for my grandma, she refused to take the doll down. I kept having nightmares of the doll and so did everyone else. Then finally, like anyone else would do, I took the doll and took its eyes out because I thought if she couldn't see us anymore it would stop. I put the doll back up and my family was horrified. I did not want an ass whooping so of course I didn't come forward and say it was me. My family was sure the doll was cursed and blessed the house. The doll was gone the next trash day. For a week straight, my grandma prayed to us in Spanish and threw holy water the moment you walked through the door. Then one day, me and my sister were playing. She's like, you have to be happy now because grandma's doll wanted you sad. And all I told her was to shut up. Back in 2013, I was teaching English in Shukagawa Hyogo, Japan for a year. It was truly a dream come true. Well, my English center's last class got out at 22.30 and with it being Japan, I felt completely safe walking home along the Shukagawa River so late at night. Along my walk, I had to pass under the J.R. Kobe line and would pass a small Buddhist temple as I came out from under the bridge. Now I had done this walk dozens of times by then and nothing scary, let alone mildly unnerving, ever happened. It was late March, so the weather was cool and comfortable. However, I noticed that as I drew closer to the temple it got cooler, cool enough for me to zip up my hoodie and shiver. As I was coming up the path, I heard the distinct sound of someone praying at the altar. The small gong bell was rung, a 5 yen coin clattered in the altar box, and two claps to announce the prayer's presence to the gods. I stopped for a brief second thinking it was weird someone was out so late to say a prayer, but I shrugged it off and moved on. Turning the corner, I expected to see someone at the altar, but it was empty. I froze. There was absolutely no way someone could have prayed so fast and bolted off without me hearing them along the gravel path. It was then I noticed how still the night was. No bugs or birds, no sounds of the city, and the river to my left sounded muted. The feeling of being watched and unwelcomed washed over me. Slowly I began to move, the temple now to my back. I took just a few steps before I heard the bell, the coin, and two claps. Fear gripped me. I broke out into a cold sweat as the shadows of the trees seemed to grow dark and deep. I gathered my nerve and anxiously turned to face the temple. 
nothing but a vacant temple. Slowly I turned and started walking again. Then suddenly, I heard two clear as day claps in my left ear. Needless to say, I bolted the rest of the way home. After that night, I avoided passing by that temple whenever I worked the later classes and opted to just take the long way home. The first time I encountered the boy downstairs was on a hot sunny afternoon. It was a Saturday and I was putting some laundry through the machines. At the time I was living with my in-laws in the northwest of Calgary. The house was a four level California split with a basement and sub-basement. The laundry room was in the sub, along with a small utility room and the entertainment room. One time when I was down there sorting clothes, I heard a faint humming, like a child playing with their toys. Immediately I stopped what I was doing and called out, Hello? I didn't expect an answer as I was the only one home, but the humming stopped. Brushed it off as my imagination and finished what I was doing, then turned to go back up the stairs. While I was turning, a cold spot hit me. Not a wind or a breeze from an AC vent, but a cold that sunk into my bones, raised the hair on the back of my head, and evoked shivers of being watched, stalked, and assessed. I mustered my courage to walk straight through the cold spot and took the stairs, forcing myself not to hurry. With each step, I broke out into cold sweats and shakes. I kept telling myself I was not afraid. This wasn't the first time I had lived in a haunted house. I just had to show him who's boss. At the last top step, a door below slammed shut. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I whipped around and looked down the stairs at the only two doors. They were both open. Screw this. I took the remaining stairs two at a time, barely hearing the faint laughter of a child as I reached the top. Later that evening, as I was playing cards with my mother-in-law, I asked her if she had experienced anything strange in the house. Her nonchalant reply caught me off guard. Yeah, there's a little boy who lives down in the basement. We're not sure how he died, but he can be temperamental when provoked. I asked her if she had ever tried to have him removed. She said they tried once, but he retaliated by going after their youngest son. He experienced nightmares and panic attacks for weeks. Once they left the boy alone, he left their son alone. She then warned me to just be polite and ignore him. Weeks went by and nothing happened. I almost forgot that he was there, until another time when I went downstairs to do laundry. It was nearly the exact situation, sun shining, warm day, and I was home alone. This time, halfway down the stairs I heard the humming. It was soft and non-threatening. Setting my basket in the laundry room, I went to the entertainment room where the sound was coming from. I looked around and saw nothing out of the ordinary. The humming seemed to be coming from the middle of the floor, like he was sitting down. I looked straight at the area and spoke to him. I'm not afraid of you, and you better leave my little brother alone, or I'll come after you. The temperature in the room dropped. The humming stopped and the sunlight streaming in from the window darkened, as if something was blocking it. Mustering my courage and squaring my shoulders, I turned my back in his apparent tantrum. It didn't take long to put my clothes in the washer, and as the minutes ticked by with no incident, I began to relax. I picked up my basket and headed out of the room, then got to the first step. Cold like a wall slammed into me from the front. From behind, I felt small hands gripping my shirt trying to pull me backwards. Frozen and cold in fear, I fought the forces trying to keep me in the basement. As the small hand gripped stronger, I felt a torrent of emotions, pure hot rage, fear and confusion all tumbled through me and stole my breath. When I looked up the stairs, I saw a shadow of a door at the top. It was old and battered. Looking closer, it appeared to have marks on it, scratches from the nails of small hands. With my last bit of strength, I lurched forward out of the boy's grasp. Scrambling up the stairs, I glanced back to the archway. There, covered in paint and barely visible, I can make out the screw holes of where a door once was. Across from the hinges and up higher, I could make out where a padlock once was to keep the door locked and secure whoever was in the basement from leaving. That's when I began to hear humming, soft and innocent. A child was playing. Best to leave him alone, I thought, and made my way out of the basement. The first house my parents bought instead of renting was an old two-story fixer-upper that was one house down from a funeral home. My mom has always taken odd feelings very seriously, and she truly believes in her ability to sense spirits and whatnot. 
I always poked fun at her for it until we moved into this house. It was a three bedroom, two bath and the staircase split the two bedrooms that made up the entire second story. My brother and I took those rooms, but not for long because nobody could ever figure out why the second floor remained freezing cold, even in the summer, despite the house lacking central air and heat. It was too cold to sleep, even with multiple comforters and plug-in heaters, so we just kept all our stuff up there and had to alternate taking turns on the couch and love seat in the living room for six years, every night. Even when we had friends sleep over, we would explain to them the situation and take them upstairs so they could see how freaking cold it stayed up there for no good reason. That's odd, but not necessarily haunted. Then little things started to happen. My mom would swear up and down on her life that when she was home alone being a housewife during the day, the dining table chairs would move on their own. Then she said lights would turn off randomly, even though the wall switch was still flipped up. She was so bothered by this that she had our Catholic priest come bless the house. When he went upstairs to sprinkle the holy water, he said he didn't feel good being up there. This only freaked my mom out more. After the blessing took place, more weird things started to happen like pictures falling off the wall. My brother and I were middle school age and I suppose my parents didn't want to freak us out so they told us that the house was just old and settling when the stairs started to creak at night, as if someone was walking up and down on them. We took it at face value as kids do until one night, my brother and I were sleeping on the couch and love seat like usual when my brother says he was woken up because he heard me talking to someone. He looked up and says he saw me standing at the foot of the staircase, looking up and speaking a different language. He grabbed me and walked me back to the couch where I went back to sleep, but he said he couldn't sleep anymore that night. He told our parents about it the next morning and they sat me down and told me what he said had happened. I'd never sleepwalked before that night and I have never since. The priest was called back over and blessed the house again. He spent hours praying over things and sprinkling holy water in every room. He even gave us little statues of Mary that had a small bowl at the bottom for us to hang by the door, and he delivered us a bottle of holy water regularly to keep refilling it. My parents started making us dip our fingers in the holy water and do the sign of the cross with it every time we went through the door. They immediately got in contact with a realtor to sell the house and move. I was young when this happened, but about a year ago, I was a senior in college catching up with a friend from high school three years older when he said, Can I ask you something? What was it like when you lived in the house on Elm Street? And I got the most uneasy feeling in my stomach. Her asking me about it meant she, and likely others, also knew there was something off about the house. I'm still not a huge believer in ghosts and spirits. I'm of the belief that when we die, we die and our bodies decay in the ground and that's the end of it. But I've never been able to explain or rationalize my experiences living there. This happened to me when I was in college. Probably one of the creepiest and weirdest things to ever happen to me. I believe in ghosts. I have had countless experiences in my life that have made it almost impossible for me not to. This still gives me chills whenever I think about it. I was a freshman in college and was heavily involved in the arts. Theater and music specifically. The fine arts building of my college had quite a bit of history. It was built in 1916 and had previously been one of the largest Masonic temples in the city. This is fairly evident by the Masonic symbols adorning the building and covering the stained glass windows. I had heard rumors of secret passageways under the building that ran all the way into downtown, but I will say, I didn't believe them. A few of my professors had told stories of seeing shadow people or feeling like they were being watched when they knew they were alone, but I thought they were just messing with us freshmen. I spent most of my time in the costume shop. I should note, the costume shop was on the sub-ground floor, technically the basement. It was down two flights of stairs from the main entrance that led you to a landing with the costume shop and another door that I just assumed was a utility closet because it was always locked. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was just something off about it to me. On this particular evening, I had finished rehearsal for a play around 6pm and figured I would do a bit of cleaning in the costume shop while I waited for my roommate to meet me so we could go grab some dinner. I was inside the costume shop when I heard a knock at the door. I walked over and looked out the small window to the right side of the door expecting to see my roommate, but there was no one. I opened the door and stepped out looking around. 
I looked down the hallway to the left of the door to see if my roommate was hiding trying to freak me out. Nothing. I shrugged it off as me being tired and went back into the shop and shut the door behind me. I went about my business for a bit until I heard another knock at the door a few minutes later. I was more hesitant this time. I walked to the door and again looked out the small window. Still there was no one outside. I tried to open the door and while the handle turned, the door wouldn't budge. I pulled harder thinking maybe the door was stuck, but it didn't feel like that. It felt like someone was holding the door shut. I looked out the window again and still didn't see anyone. I was now frantically pulling on the handle feeling the fear rising in my chest. I let go of the handle only to have it start shaking wildly. Suddenly it stopped. Everything was quiet with the exception of my own shaky breath. Then from outside the door, I heard the sound of a door creaking open. I gathered my strength and tried the door. It opened and I cautiously walked onto the landing. The always locked door was ajar. I called out, Hello? Is anyone there? I tried not to sound freaked out, but I was absolutely terrified. I pulled open the door and was greeted by a pitch black staircase leading down. It smelled like a tomb that had just been unsealed after a hundred years. Musty and ancient. I felt the wall for a light switch but couldn't find one. I reached into my pocket for my cell phone and turned the screen on. It was bright enough that I could sort of see as I made my way down the stairs. The walls were brick and the stairs were made of stone. The closer I got to the bottom, the colder it became. I was on the second to last step, straining to see what was in front of me. It was a door, a large stone door. I was about to move to the last step when I heard it. A voice. It was deep and sounded like it was right in front of me. It said only one word, welcome. I couldn't even scream. Instead, I ran up the stairs, tripping at one point and skinning my knee and shin. Once I reached the top, I slammed the door shut and ran out of the building. My roommate showed up five minutes later to find me standing on the sidewalk, shaking. After I told her what had happened, she went inside to get my things and locked the costume shop door. When she came out, she looked at me with a worried expression. That door was wide open when I went to get your stuff. Are you sure you closed it? I just nodded my head. We walked home and didn't really talk more about it. I didn't go back into the building until the end of the next week. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. When I finally did, I descended the stairs and felt a chill shoot through my body. I looked at the wall where the door had been and there was nothing there. It was just a wall. I thought I was losing my mind. I walked to the wall and studied it. My drama teacher happened to be walking by and I stopped him. Wasn't there a door here? He chuckled. Yeah, they walled it up last week. Did it in a hurry too, not entirely sure why though. I always thought it was a closet or something. I can't say what I encountered that night. Was it the spirit of a Freemason who never left their temple? Was it something more sinister? I honestly don't know. I spent a lot of time in that building over the course of my two years at that college, and while I had other odd experiences, they were nothing compared to what I experienced that one awful night. I'm not really a believer in the supernatural, but I've had two or three unexplainable experiences that give me goosebumps to this day. One of those experiences happened to me and my family back in 2009 when I was in high school. A few weeks prior to this, my whole family and I had gone through an extremely traumatic experience where we were tied up and robbed at gunpoint by five men in our home here in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was a fairly big house and we each had our own rooms, but my two sisters and I decided to put our mattresses together in the living room and sleep there till the end of the month before moving to our new home where we felt safer. All of us were already terrified being in that house, and what we heard that night just sent us over the edge. We all went to sleep around 8pm and our little dog snuggled in amongst us. At the entrance to the living room in this house, there was this strange black glass mirror wall that was about a meter wide and two meters tall. This glass always freaked us out because it seemed to have no purpose. You couldn't really see your reflection too well in it as it was really dark, and our dog often barked at it for no reason. At this point, we didn't care about the glass wall, and we were more scared of real intruders so we put our silly fears aside and set up our sleeping area right in front of it. 
We were all sleeping soundly at around 3 a.m. All of us woke up at the same time to the sound of what I can only describe as being a painful, long, ominous moan. It started out like a low whimper and went on for a few seconds before increasing in volume and ending in a scream. It lasted for what felt like 10 seconds and we all woke up right at the beginning and sat up. The sound felt like it was coming from right in front of us and our dog went crazy before cowering as if someone was there. I grabbed my sister's hand and as soon as the sound stopped, my eldest sister jumped up and smashed on the light. Our dog just stared at the mirror with his hair standing up straight as nails. We immediately went to the opposite side of the house and woke up my parents who were baffled by what we told them. To this day I think about that moan and how painful and depressing it sounded. There was no way I was just hearing things because we all woke up and heard it together. My sisters were way older than me and they always tried to discredit anything paranormal but that incident spooked them and made them think otherwise. I like to think that the culmination of all the bad energy, fear, anxiety, and trauma we had experienced during the robbery conjured up something that was an incarnation of sadness and despair. I heard its voice that night. To start off, here is some background information. About 20 years ago, my parents moved back to my mom's childhood home in northern Michigan shortly after my older sister was born. Six years later, I was born. My sister, we'll call her Lila, is now 21 and I'm 15. My sister and I have always been very close and growing up she took care of me very often. I still consider her one of my primary caretakers. Here's some info about the house. It is nearly surrounded by a lush forest and we have a very large backyard. We have a long driveway that leads up to our road. On the road, there is a medium-sized cemetery with graves dating back to the early 1800s, as well as many unmarked graves. Both my sister and I would regularly take walks up to the cemetery as kids. It's a very short walk that takes less than 5 minutes. Anyways, let's get to the actual story. A few years after my parents settled down in our current home, my sister was a toddler at the time and I was not yet born, my sister began speaking to an imaginary friend named Bobby. My mom would find my sister outside, giggling and talking to herself. When asked who she was talking to, my sister told my parents her friend was named Bobby. My parents believed it was simply an imaginary friend which is very common to have around her age. Flash forward a few years later. My sister was approximately 8 or 9 years old and I was a toddler. I was a very energetic, curious child and I would very often walk around the neighborhood while my mom was asleep. I was almost always playing outside or trying to go on some sort of an adventure. It was like any other day and I was out playing in the yard. My mom came out and checked on me. She found me giggling to myself and talking out loud. She asked who I was talking to. I told her it was my friend Bobby. She immediately remembered my sister's imaginary friend a few years prior who had the same name. My mother, being a superstitious Christian, picked me up and commanded Bobby to leave. She respectfully told him he was not welcomed at our house. After that, I stopped talking to Bobby. A few years later, my mom and I were casually discussing my childhood when this came up. I had very little recollection of Bobby and only vaguely remembered having an imaginary friend. To this day, I am incredibly fascinated and perplexed by what my mom told me. My older sister can still recall her walks in the cemetery and her imaginary friend. I believe this is an instance of children and their ability to accept reality as it is without questioning it. I would like to think Bobby was just a lonely soul who found joy in playing with my sister and I.